Welcome once again to Lato's Law. Here's Steve Lato. I've been doing videos on this channel now for nine years, nine years, and there's one giant elephant in the room that I've not yet addressed, and I've avoided it, I've tap danced around it, I pretended it doesn't exist, but it has become unavoidable. So now is the time I'm going to address it once and once only. That's it. So we're talking, of course, about the turbo encabulator, the uh, legal aspects of the turbo encabulator. So first warning, I am not addressing the viscous decoupling episode that's been beaten to death elsewhere. And frankly, I think too many people still dwell on it even after they added the redundancy flagel discs. So not going to go there. Now, that the turbine encabulators have been in widespread use for the last eight decades. Most of the legal issues surrounding them were thought to have been resolved. Thought to have been resolved. Except, of course, those surrounding the distraint warranty, if any, and the adverse allocator assumption, which I will address here in order. So first of all, some of you might expect a little bit of history here just to make sure you got the context right. According to the Turbo Encabulator, a historical and technical analysis in the Journal of Engineering Education, Volume 88, famously 2008, you'll know this, the Turbo Encabulator was the end result of an unrelated project from the early 1940s undertaken by a team of engineers at Rockwell Automation. The team was tasked with developing a new type of machine that could automatically synchronize cardinal grammeters. The team worked for 10 years on the project and, as is the case with many great leaps in science and technology, through sheer serendipity, they developed a working prototype of the first turbo encabulator, which not only allowed for automatic synchronization of the grammeters, but was also useful for mining gold, building houses, and even generating alternating current. So the possibilities appeared to be boundless at that time. Now, because engineers and businessmen in heavy industries recognized immediately the myriad possible uses of the turbo encabulator in various configurations, which even in the early modalities ranged from pantoplasmic reconfiguration to modular decomposter to pre-faulted stator, industry uptake was rapid and flamulent. It was a rare sector of the burgeoning turbo industrial complex that was not seeing high adoption metrics synergizing exorbitant financial returns along with the double effect of positive public reputation for Rockwell Automation and its downstream customers and consumers. But of course, that's when the lawsuits started. So here's where we're getting at. The lawsuits at first were comparatively simple and indeed manifested at a rate within constraints predicted remarkably by the turbo encabulator itself, running in a decross stator mode infilgated with an early implementation of a LexisNexis-style legal database. Legal historicians and tech-savvy jurisprudence agree that the subsequent successful disposition of the first wave of cases depended on the high-quality, technically aware, and specially credentialed attorneys that Rockwell Automation had attracted, but simply would not have been possible without the data derived by the turbo encabulator itself. Thus, when the Supreme Court upheld the doctrine of Corpus Juris Quaternum in the case of City of Detroit versus one 1947 Tudor sedan Fleetmaster, 1946 case, in which the Supreme Court ruled that the use of a turbo encabulator to construct a house was legal and that the landowner was therefore not liable for damage to the neighboring land or the car residing on it, it was a feather in the Rockwell Legal Department's collective cap. What they failed to see at the time, however, was that the implied reliance on a justum generis in the analysis of hypothecation through a writ of dedimus, relying on cadastrals that had not been revised since the early 19th century, and which incongruously relied on the traditional British methods of meets and bounds, strictly implied the invalidity of the immersions that the company had been employing as a matter of routine, especially when the claim includes what are clearly ontologically and jurisprudentially distinct categories such as automobile and real property. You'll recall that the court opined with unusual gravitas, cars are not dirt. Thus, when in what appeared to be just another routine case a few years later, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that a turbo encabulator is a machine within the meaning of the modus decimundi. No one expected the floodgates to be opened, Floodgates had been previously thought to have been 
securely closed by Detroit versus one 1947 two-door sedan. This was, of course, a case that has figured prominently in law school classrooms since and caused law students to have many sleepless nights and long, uncomfortable minutes of Socratic suffering in class. Talking, of course, about the notorious case of U.S. versus 17 ball bearings more or less in the possession of known but unidentified Rockwell engineers. The distraint warranty at issue in 17 ball bearings was facially simple. If your encabulator misfunctioned, complainants argued that remedies should be free. But there was a catch. The owner of the encabulator had to pay for the repairs or replacement up front and then request reimbursement of the fee for service, capitation, and bundled payment as was appropriate afterward. The lesson here seems to be that sometimes corporate lawyers lose sight of trends in courts and thus lose a necessary degree of risk-averse awareness. Now, distraint warranties for turbo encabulators remain a rich source of litigation income for specialist law firms, many of which are familiar to us from national advertising campaigns. You've seen the commercial. Have you been hurt by a turbo encabulator? Record-setting awards and some jury trials have not been uncommon. Public interest in these remains high, of course, because of the ubiquitous nature of the integration of the turbo encabulator into digital networks. A true measure of the deep implications of the application of transistor technology and then computer chips to 12th and later generation encabulators is found in the odd, almost perverse application of the principle modus de non decimando in yet another landmark case, Bennis versus Peterman, 1995. The confusion of the legal principle de non decimando with the medieval dictum magna de curant parva negligent in the famous footnote four of Bennis remains an unexplained and unexplored legal minefield. And trust me on that one. A legal luminary of no less stature than Harvard Law Professor Sturgis Holmes Horton recently published a 238-page analysis with 1,138 footnotes in the Journal of Electromechanical Law called The Right Only Memory Slot and the Turbo Encabulator, a legal analysis with diagrams. Whether the current U.S. Supreme Court will adopt his suggested framework, Malo Mori Quam Fadori, remains an open question. But it's worth noting that the pushback against Professor Holmes Horton has been not insignificant. Earlier, I noted I was not going to talk about the viscous decoupling episode. My good friend Ed Bolian has addressed this more than once on his channel, and I have little to add to his analysis, but I salute him for boldly stepping into that minefield. But I think I should close with an observation. The current development of AI large language models, such as ChatGPT and Google's BARD, create manifold de novo questions. It's almost impossible for most people to really understand how vast is the amount of data that has been used to train these when much of that data actually derives from the post 12th generation turbo encabulator itself. Here I think we can expect development along the same lines as self-driving cars, jetpacks, and even AI legal advisors, and that's probably just the tip of the iceberg. So suffice it to say that this field, although extensively litigated, is remarkably unsettled even after all of these decades. With the ubiquity of the turbo encabulator in seemingly every aspect of our lives, that situation will grow more complex over time, not simpler. Thus, having given you this concise statement of the law to date, I will close this chapter and not address the legal issues of the turbo encabulator again on this channel. So there you go. Uh, most requested topic probably ever, but I will not address it again simply because I, I can't win. I can't win. So thank you very much. Questions or comments, put them below. But that's it for the Turbo Encabulator. Bye bye. Thank you for watching Lato's Law. What the deuce? Turbo Encabulator? Huh.